Welcome back. It seems that the coronavirus pandemic and the hunger are not the only factors endangering our collective human existence at this period. As the National Human Rights Commission has reported that the law enforcement agents who are supposed to protect the people have killed 18 persons while enforcing the lockdown ordered by President Buhari to curb the further spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the Lagos State Governor, Mr. Babajide Saonlu, had promised the deployment of more policemen in the state to protect its residents during the lockdown period. How sure are we that these law enforcement officers are not the ones we might need protection from? And still with us on this conversation is political analyst Ugochuku Ikiako. Thank you, Ugochuku, for staying with us. Now, there were reported cases during the first um, two weeks of, of lockdown in some states where there were protestations and even, even killings. And uh, now we're having um, the, the Human Rights Commission reporting this. What, what is the security implication of this report from the NHRC? Uh, it shows that, uh, it, shows, it, it still reviews what we've been battling over a long period of time, all right, uh, prior, to, prior to the uh, uh, the coronavirus uh, issue that we're, we're facing uh, present, uh, presently. Uh, we've had consistently a, a conversation about police brutality, uh, uh, our security officials taking the law into their hand and doing what they're not supposed to do. Uh, you, you, see, you see them carry anti-judicial anti killings and uh, are doing things they're not supposed to do. So uh, this whole period, instead of them to uh, do better, we're still hearing that same stories, and uh, it, show, it shows where we are as a society. It, show, it still shows uh, the things that is still wrong with us. That despite this great tragedy that we're facing, we still have uh, uh, tragedies across our communities, across uh, our state, where uh, police people, where uh, law enforcement uh, officers are killing people instead of helping them to uh, sort of protecting their life. It is a sad situation, and, and I'm glad that. Uh, the Human Rights Commission brought it out, it's a, brought it to our knowledge for, the, for Nigerians to know, for the world to know, okay, this is happening despite the fact that we're facing this crisis. So hopefully at the end of this, at the end of this uh, uh, coronavirus issue, when, when we're out of this lockdown, uh, I'm, I'm expecting that uh, the right thing will be done, that this, this, uh, this uh, security officer that, that we have found wanting should be tried and prosecuted for, uh, you know, anti All right. And joining us live by Skype is security expert, Mr. Adekoya Onyekachi. Thank you, Onyekachi, for joining us. Thank you, Benny, for having me. Good evening to the viewers. Thank you. Now, last week you were on the show with me here where we did consider the security implications of the lockdown. Now in the news, the National Human Rights Commission has reported that law enforcement agents have killed 18 persons while enforcing the lockdown ordered by the federal government to cover the spread of the COVID-19. In your security expert, um, expertise, I beg your pardon, I mean, what are the implications of this report? Uh, I think the report, um, well, sadly, uh, just highlights the state of policing in Nigeria. Um, uh, I think we are also just sensationalizing the report, as sad as it is. Uh, more people die in Nigeria from police brutality. Uh, that we can even just leave me to the coronavirus case. And I, I dare say that uh, to some extent, our senses have become numbed uh, to these extrajudicial killings. So uh, it's sad, it's regrettable, but it just highlights the problem that we have with policing in Nigeria as it is today. Uh, so, I mean, that's just my take on it. The issues with uh, policing a uh, lockdown and the issues of um, increasing rate of crime is also there for us to battle with. Uh, just one more sad, one more sad um, um, indices to worry about, I guess. Yeah. Now, Oyekachi, as much as I know that there is a need for us to enforce the lockdown order and protect lives and properties at this time, now should we just have any security personnel, any mobile policeman on our road? Should, shouldn't be, there shouldn't be a specification of those who should be on our roads at this time, given the social crisis we do find ourselves in? So, um, Benny, there's, uh, now is not really the time for um, some of this, um, if I may call them showboating as it were, when it comes to issues of security. Um, we are, if you understand the death straits we find ourselves in, um, you understand that we are seriously challenged. We have about 302,000 policemen less than 110,000 military personnel. As a matter of fact, today, uh, I noticed that the government has had to call out the Peace Corps, members of the Peace Corps. And if, you, if you've been following the story of the Peace Corps very well, government is yet to ascend to the Peace Corps bill. 
But the Peace Corps already been deployed in Lagos as we speak. It just shows you that we don't have enough personnel at this time. You don't even have enough personnel to do a proper shift pattern. Even if we are stretching them, uh, the security forces are stretching them to operate 12 hours, you still don't have the people to do night shifts. So most deployment you find is in the daytime. Um, the next set you find is in the nighttime. And at that time, the numbers are thinned out. So for now, I think that government is going with everything it has. Um, like everybody has said, the COVID-19 um, situation just highlights our state of lack of preparedness. Then further also brings to forth the challenges that we're having in the country today. So uh, maybe we, we deal with what we have now. Post-COVID-19, we can come back to begin to address um, some of these issues. I hope we address them in a frontal um, and fair manner. Yeah, but you know, the challenge in that is while, while we wait for the post-COVID-19 era, uh, more lives could be lost in this process. And so that, that begs for the question of, of training. You know, the, the question of training comes to four. Do these officers have any sort of training on, on social and, and human crisis management? Because I get what you're saying. Now, if we allow them to go on, uh, because you feel now the, the, the situation at hand is it's quite an emergency, so should we allow them to be on our, on our roads? In, in, in their bidding trying to enforce the lockdown order, Human lives have been lost. So how do we how so do we balance this divide? So let's also be fair to the government forces. The soldiers involved in the worry issue, I understand that are being charged and they are facing persecution right now. Um, the, I think one or two policemen that are also involved in similar incidents have also been have been dealt with. Um, I do think and suspect that Lagosians would generally agree. Uh, that the security forces has been uh, maybe to some extent also reasonable and fair-minded in their in their enforcement. So it's not all bad and um, gloom as it were. Uh, you would always have one or two cases. I, I do know for a fact um, that um, you have a DIG um, now in Lagos to control Lagos and Ogun and the enforcement operations, and the police has put out numbers. Uh, public complaint numbers for the public to reach out to them with assurances that they will deal with all such uh, uh, inf infractions. So it's not all bad and gloom. Um, these things do happen, particularly in, a, in, in an almost failed structure as we have. You know, it's, it's, it's sad, but we really have to work with what we have. Uh, I do appeal for some calm and some support for the government security agencies, particularly for the hierarchy. Uh, the, the police IGP, I know, is a very reasonable person, has a good background in Interpol, has done one or two um, assignments with UN. He, I understand he understands clearly voluntary principles, human rights principles, even in law enforcement. And we have seen from this new police hierarchy um, a willingness to move towards civil approach. Okay, but we know it's not yet per perfect. As every other thing in Nigeria, security is also work in progress. So uh, I think that should be the way we look at it. Let's segment um, the issues that we have at hand, separate it, deal with it, while we also try and deal with the bigger issue of um, increasing um, crime rates, unrest, and um, 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 youth restlessness. All right, Gochukwu, I come to you still. I need some, uh, some of your reaction to a few things um, the security expert just said. Now, we're, we're dealing with a social crisis as much as also, human management is key, is critical. Now, um, it's always easy to blame the failed structure, the, the health sector has failed, the, the, the police needs reform. I mean, and this seems to always seem to be what we hear, excuses for why people sometimes get away with the, the wrong that they do. We understand there's a need to enforce the law, the lockdown order. And yet the, the people who you're meant to be protecting at this point in time um, being gone down by the same law enforcement agencies. What can we do in this situation? Let, let's talk about social crisis and human management in situations like this. Well, uh, I think it's, it's a two-way thing, yeah. all right? And from what, what Onyekachi is saying, uh, there's a part where uh, already some, some ugly incidents have taken place already, like in Warren, in some other part of the country, like the uh, NHR has already stated. Yeah. Uh, those people that are involved in this, the, the, the security officials that are involved in this, uh, the persecution should take place immediately. And when that happens, what it does is it serves as a deterrence so that other security officials, as they go in, as they go into the street, as they carry out their duties daily, they understand how to approach this thing. They understand that this is a human right. This this is a social issue. This is take a more humanistic approach as they deal with the people, as they as they interface with the communities. This is what needs to be done. Uh, the job out there is difficult. It's challenging even for them 
all right? Because uh, a lot of them we are not trained, a lot of them we are not properly equipped, and that is the truth, all right, on issues like this, all right? A lot of them. So uh, hopefully, like you said, after this, after this whole crisis, uh, we should take a lot of learnings in terms of equipping our police, uh, our security officials, and the rest of them on how to manage issues like this. But uh, we just have to keep learning and keep improving. Uh, for those that have gone out to, uh, do what the law doesn't, they didn't ask them to do, uh, kill people in the course of this lockdown, that, talking about security uh, uh, officials, they should be prosecuted immediately, uh, derobed, and um, make sure that they face uh, uh, the law effectively. And if that happens, what it does is serve as a deterrence. So if you're going into the street, no matter how, no matter how it is for you, no matter how provocating it is for you, you, you learn how to caution yourself, you learn how to do your job, understanding that the law is your guide, the law is what make sure that you do what is supposed to be done. If not, then we're animals. Because the most important thing is that in, in our communities, we, we know there is a breach of trust between the security, security agencies and the people. All right? The security agencies uh, officials need, as they enter this community, to have this thing in their mindset. You can't go into a community, kill people because you're trying to enforce a lockdown. Or it, that's the breach of trust. If there's an issue in the community, if there's someone that is exposed to coronavirus, they will find it difficult to call the police. They will find it difficult to report to NCDC. So we all need to work together on this. We all need to work both the security agencies, both the uh, community heads and the rest of them. If we can do this, if we can do this, like you, like you mentioned, talking about the uh, security challenges we're having in different parts of Lagos, people can willingly submit information to the police. They can willingly come up and say, okay, we know who is doing this, we know who is doing that, we know who is fermenting trouble there. By doing that, the police working together with DSS or whoever they need to work with, all right, will make arrests, get people that need to be, People take these people out of the street so that people can be safe. That is the most important thing. People are not safe in their house under this lockdown, right? 11 o'clock, 2, uh, 2 a.m., people are tweeting, people are complaining across social media that this is happening. And we've seen videos, we've seen pictures. So government needs to be more proactive, not just uh, allowing the, uh, the, uh, the security officials to go away scot free, but also to make sure that the community people, what is happening in the communities, the people are safe themselves. If that doesn't happen, it defeats the essence of letting people stay at home. Yeah. Now, um um, Adeko, I, I come back to you now. I mean, we, there was a, the first two weeks of this of this lockdown, and we're we're in 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 the second two weeks again. Now, what what would you think is critical for our security personnel to to take cognizance of to avoid a, a reputation? Because this um, this report by the NHRC um, it was the first phase of the lockdown from March 30 to April 13. Now, we know that there's a social crisis and the world is engulfed in. Now, I also want to ask you as a security expert, are you saying we don't have any sort of formal training for our security personnel when it comes to social crisis and human management? And if there are, shouldn't be these people we're, we're, we're dispatching and um, setting out to, to enforce this law, knowing that they, they will have um, a, a better way, professional way, to actually go about their duties without necessarily resorting to, to a shootout. Yeah, so uh, Benny, um, the problems the problems are quite plenty. Um, but let's let's look at it like this: if you garbage in, you process your garbage out. Um, all of us are here. We're all here in Nigeria. We remember when some I think a news station did a report on the police training college in Ikeja, and you could see the state of the police training college. So that's where people are supposed to imbibe new culture and take on a new persona of service. Okay, so the, the pre-deployment training is one thing. Post-deployment continuous training is another kettle of fish. Uh, so a man has been in the force for 15 years. He's done his pre-deployment training. Um, he's been you know, commissioned. He's now an officer. Uh, but his work environment is also... Um, not encouraging. It's, it's like some people say that uh, culture we eat strategy for breakfast. So we can espouse uh, all the ideals we want to see of the security forces. Uh, if you care to know, go to the police stations and see the conditions under which these people have to work. You, you will be surprised at how they're able to even maintain any form of um, reasonability um, to themselves and as they walk. Uh, I mean, there are some things we don't want to see on air as to how they fund the operations, where they get the money from, the challenges they have. When was the last time we actively bought rifles for the policemen? I'm not even talking about training. The IGP almost put out a budget of almost $1 trillion in terms of um, ammunition and requirements that he needs for the police. This is without training, and training is not cheap. Training is very expensive. We've not even sorted out the issue of logistic support. What is the police budget? The police budget is about 340 something billion, 350 something billion. About 90% of that goes into recurrent expenditure. 
The KPES side of it, they don't even get up to 4% capital release for the things they need to do. This is even without training. So uh, as Nigerians, uh, I, I almost sadly want to think that we are getting the kind of police we have paid for, the kind of police that we deserve. Sadly also, remember, that this police we have is not our police really. This is a pre-colonial era police, a police that was set up for the interests of the colonial masters, the, the now, police that was set up yeah, to protect we're trade. Time. We're running out of time. Sorry, right. I need to cut in here. I need to cut you in here. Yeah. Now, quickly, uh, a quick reaction yeah. from you. Now, on Tuesday, Mr. Yeah. Governor, like he said he wants to be referred to, Babajide Saolu of Lagos State, gave a statement that there will be an increase in the deployment of mobile police officers on all troubled spots of the metropolis. Now, in the light of the report from the NHRC, what could be the possible downsides to this? More deployed, more increased police personnel on our streets. Benia, I'll, 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 I'll first be concerned about where he will get the more policemen. Where would he, would he all of a sudden, I, I don't know where he's going to get the policemen from. So I wait to see the more deployments. I've, I've driven around the streets of Lagos. I, I can tell you for a fact, I've seen more neighborhood watch, more Peace Corps member, more NSCDC, very few police. The police you see by midday, they are gassed out, they are sitting down, they are tired. They are all human beings like us. So uh, let's wait to see the deployment first. Then we can begin to worry about those other issues. Uh, so I, I think there will be an upside if we can get that deployment um, than more of a downside. Because at this time, we need security presence at strategic locations at the remote parts of Lagos, at the border communities. We need to give the people a sense of assurance of security. They need to see security, they need to feel security, and they, they need to also be assured that government is on top of their game. So until I see the security deployment, I think we, we have more to worry on our hands than the downside. Onyekachi Adekoya, security expert, thank you for joining us on Plus Politics and for your contribution. Thank you for having me, Ben. Now, Gochuk, I want to take a quick reaction to that. On Tuesday, um, Mr. Governor, that's what he said he wants to be referred to now, I mean, made this statement. How do you react to this? Um, like um, Mr. Ekaji stated, um, we, have, we have a lot of issues in this country. We have a lot of issues in the state in terms of uh, security, uh, poverty, hunger, and, uh, and it's all showing itself, this period. So, uh, and we are not a proactive people. We are very reactive. We are, we are reacting to all these situations. We are not. We are not. We are not planning ahead to see how can we mitigate some of these things. So, uh, I don't know where these. Uh, I don't know where the police officers are going to come out from. Uh, I don't know where, uh, how they're going to redeploy them or what they're going to do special. But for me, uh, it is time for us to work with the limited resources that we have. Uh, I, I need to see uh, the, the the synergy, most especially between the DSSS. And the police, all right? Uh, how they have improved on intelligence gathering? How are they going into, into these communities to fish out the people that the, 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 the people that are the perpetrators of the violence, of the wave of violence that we're seeing across the state? If you can do that, if you can go ahead and arrest the kingpins, the leaders of these gangs, the leaders of these groups that are trying to uh, uh, cause trouble, make it difficult for people to live and be, be be peaceful at this point, it will go a long way to, to sort this out. Uh, the deployment. I'm not excited about it, but I want to see what is happening in terms of intelligence gathering, in terms of picking people that are causing trouble, in terms of how you, uh, how you prosecute them. If th these things can be done swiftly, it will serve as a, it will serve as a great deterrent to all these, some of these communities. But if you don't do that, uh, like, like, who are you going to deploy? Where are you going to pick them? Is it from the police college in Kano? Nobody's going to send anybody for you at this moment. So what we have, we are, we are short, short, short chain. So we just have to we need work with what we have and do more with intelligence and prosecution. Political analyst Gochuku Kiako, thank you for joining us on Plus Politics Thanks and for your me. wonderful contribution. Thanks for having me. And thank you for staying with us. We'll take our Plus report now. And when we return, my take. Stay with us. Following the fallout of the coronavirus pandemic in China, which has affected several countries worldwide, several videos have been making the round on social media showing maltreatment of Africans by Chinese authorities, especially in the Guangdong province of China. This has generated much reactions nationwide, as many Nigerians have condemned the act. To set the record straight, the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs summoned the Chinese ambassador to Nigeria to get to the root of the matter. 
The Chinese ambassador Zumpinjang says measures have been put in place to protect Nigerians and other African nationals. Why the government select FCT, Lagos, Algon? Is the government of Nigeria discriminating against FCT? I don't think so. The same logic goes in Guangzhou. The city is trying to test everyone for the security, for the safety, healthy of themselves and others. Mr. Pingjian says Nigerians remain an important partner of China. There is nothing whatsoever changed in China's policy of friendship towards Africa. We cherish, we are fully committed to our strategic partnership, partnership with Nigeria. We have full confidence in Nigeria's determination and capacity, capability to triumph over this disease. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Geoffrey Onyema, also disclosed that allegations of isolating only Africans in China is false and was caused by lack of communication between Chinese authorities and foreign nationals resident in China. It's unfortunate that the, 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 the government in Guangdong uh, did not reach out early enough to our authorities, uh, consulates uh, in uh, Guangdong and uh, Shanghai and Beijing. But now that communication has been established and they're now working together as a team, communicating and letting everybody know that these measures are to assure the safety of the Nigerians as well as everybody in China and in particular in uh, Guangdong uh, province. Mr. Oyema says Nigerian authorities have been assured of the safety of Nigerians in China and is currently engaging relevant Chinese authorities to resolve any misunderstanding that may have arisen from the incident. In the world today we are all hostages to, to the social media and, uh, and all kinds of narratives uh, will always be pushed by whoever for whatever uh, reason. Uh, this is why um, I have prefer preferred to deal with this matter in a systematic way. Um, first of all, with our ambassador here, being in touch with our ambassador in China, our consulate uh, in Guangdong and in uh, you know, uh, Shanghai, and uh, also engaging with individual uh, Nigerians uh, who have been reaching me uh, through, um, you know, uh, social media. Idon Joseph, Plus TV, Africa. Here is my take. Currently, coronavirus cases globally stand at over 2 million, with over 130,000 deaths. In Nigeria, the cases have also risen from 1 to over 400 in just a little over a month. I think it's obvious that this virus is not a joke and that it should not be treated with levity. However, the fact that over 500,000 globally and 128 in Nigeria have recovered inspires hope. However, still, there are factors that could quickly diminish this hope if proper monitoring of this precarious period is not implemented. Let us set aside social constructs like politics and religion and stay true to our humanity. The aim is to defeat this pandemic to defeat it as soon as possible and to come out with healthy citizens and an unbroken economy. As regards our security, in the face of the pandemic, we similarly have another pandemic to deal with, which is the very possible harassment and brutalizations of citizens from the people meant to be protecting them. It is indeed sad that people have lost their lives in this period due to the abuse of power from those who have the responsibility to protect them. But this is in no way shocking, as this has gone on for a long time, especially during the time of the special anti-robbery squad, SARS. It brings to mind also names like Colade Johnson and the long list of nameless victims who have died in similar ways. I think it is time for these trigger-happy bad eggs in the security sector to be held accountable and made to pay for what they have done. Make an example of one of them and others we follow. Like the say, one should serve as the deterrent. Yes, the law needs to be enforced. Yes, people should abide by the directive of a lockdown order, 
But no, not one life should end while our security agents seek the enforcement of this particular lockdown, except, of course, their own life is threatened and can be proven beyond the shadow of a doubt. If this is not done, the number of people who will be killed by SOCA security operatives will inevitably rise. And that's our show for tonight. We'll return same time tomorrow. Please practice personal hygiene and stay safe. We will overcome this together. It's been Plus Politics, and I am Benny Ark. <laughs>